Welcome tonight to our Wisconsin Beef Special Edition, our March 23rd um, session with Matt LaRue from Cornell University. He'll be discussing profitable meat marketing using the Cornell meat processing tool. Um, with us tonight are your Extension Livestock Program um, educators, Amanda Kaufman, Bill Halfman, myself, Carolyn Eady, Ryan Steery, and Sandy Stitchin. Please stay muted tonight throughout our presentation to reduce some background noise, and please feel free to add your questions or comments in the chat section. You can find us after tonight's program at our Livestock Topic Hub at livestock.extension.wis.edu. Um, feel free to browse around in our topics and events and our news to see that we what we have been putting together for you guys. And you, if you would like to find us later on, you can also locate us in the people section. Um, we hope to see you after tonight's presentation, either online or on the hoof, preferably on the hoof, right? And we will be releasing tonight's video session as soon as it is available. We will work through some editing and add some closed captioning. And please, please complete the evaluation surveys that Sandy will be emailing you after tonight's presentation because that allows us to gather really credible information that we can move forward in programming. And like I said before, please find us at livestock.extension.wisp.edu. Let me go ahead and launch our first poll. So the, the question that we would like you guys to answer is what species are you raising for meat sales? It is multiple choice and it is anonymous. So please feel free to select any answer um, that fits your operation. The second question we have is, what markets do you currently use to sell your meat? Um, do you use farmer's markets, the freezer trade, restaurants and grocery stores, farm stores or sales at your farm, bulk bundles, regional branding programs, or other? And then the third question we have is, how confident are you in your current meat pricing? Are you very confident, somewhat confident, minimally confident, or not confident at all? And we'll give you guys a second to go ahead and um, select your answers for that. All right, seeing that we have 87%, I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll and share the results. And it looks like the majority of you um, are selling beef through your meat sales. And you're also, the majority is also using the freezer trade and the majority of you are also somewhat confident in your current meat pricing. With that, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to, to our speaker for the night. Hi, uh, good evening. Thanks for uh, inviting me out to Wisconsin. I'm, I'm based in Ithaca, New York. So I'm, I'm really glad to uh, reach out and work with you folks. And uh, you know, I, I work at Cornell University and my, my boss and, and, and friend there is a Wisconsin farm boy. So uh, it's great to make this connection for me. I'm gonna talk about a way to set prices for meat. I'm gonna focus um, on meat cuts, but I'll say you know, a couple of times during this that the meat pricing tool can also be used to price carcasses. So since the majority of you are selling through the freezer trade, quarters, halves, and holes direct to consumer, uh, this tool will still work for you. Uh, I, frankly, the using the tool to price quarters, halves, and holes is uh, easier. So uh, I'm not gonna do a demonstration of that. Just to let you know some of my background and, and what I do, I'm an extension associate at Cornell University and the College of Ag and Life Sciences. Uh, that's a relatively new position for me in 2021. Uh, I spent a year uh, out uh, on my own as an ag marketing consultant this past year. And prior to that, I, I served as a county extension office with Cornell Cooperative Extension uh, based in, in the county where Cornell is in, in, in Ithaca. So I've got lots of extension experience and I'm glad to be at the university now. While I was at my extension position, uh, I created the meat price calculator that I'm gonna to demonstrate tonight. And before all this work and, and before coming to Cornell for a master's degree in, in uh, ag product marketing in, in the ag school, uh, I worked for two small nonprofits in New England. One was the New England Livestock Alliance, which ran a branded beef program where we purchased uh, grain finished all natural beef and, and sold it through distributors. And we also uh, bought grass-fed, grass-finished beef. And then I also worked for the Heritage Breeds Conservancy in New England, um, not, not the one down in North Carolina, the, the New England Heritage Breeds Conservancy, where we were 
promoting the usage of these uh, old genetics uh, and hoping that putting them back to work would start uh, helping improve them as well. And with my role at, at New England Livestock Alliance, I uh, became an ultrasound technician for beef carcass quality. So I traveled all around um, the Northeast, ultrasounding cattle to qualify them for our beef brand uh, because we couldn't grade them. Uh, we didn't have a USDA grader in New York State. We would uh, grade them using ultrasound data in, in essence. So that, that was a great position. It gave me a lot of um, experience on, on beef farms. My approach to setting prices begins with looking at the farm's financial goals. And I would encourage you to, to start to think about, you know, in essence, how much money does the farm expect to get out of the different animals that we raise and market? So if we set financial goals for the farm, you know, annual financial goals for the farm in terms of what we could gross, and if we understand costs, then what we could net as profit. Um, then we can take that, that goal and begin to spread it across the different enterprises that we have. So I'm just giving a, a, you know, a hypothetical example here where we're going to take our $100,000 in sales goal, break it out across two species, beef and pork, in, in proportions to the way we raise those animals, and then start breaking that down into the number of head that we expect to market. So this is a, a starting point to understand what our financial goals are and what we hope that the farm can yield for us, and, and then to work out the expectations for pricing. It's, it's a starting. So we start to ask ourselves these questions about what do we hope to gross? What do we hope to retain in profit? And we can get down to per head numbers. So a basis, you know, to, to teach us what's realistic to get out of our farm and uh, perhaps guide us to the kinds of market channels that we're going to use if we, uh, if we need to achieve certain pricing. And I also wanted to introduce for you the different channels that you could sell meat through. I think we're all familiar with these. Um, I'm going to break them into car uh, channels where you sell meat by the carcass. So you're getting paid based on the carcass weight. And then those channels where you sell meat by the cut, they both include a mix of wholesale and direct to consumer channels. Wholesale being when you sell the meat to the person who's not going to eat it, they're going to go on and sell it again, like a grocery store, a restaurant, um, you know, school kitchen, something like that. Um, you do have direct-to-consumer channels that demand meat by the carcass, and that would be the freezer trade. The, the, it's, a, it's a great um, channel in that respect because it's this sort of a hybrid channel, if you will, where you're, you're not wholesaling, but you are selling by the carcass, and you still get the benefit of going direct-to-consumer. So freezer trade is a, is a unique channel in that respect. Most other direct-to-consumer channels wind up being by the cut. When we think about these different channels, you can just sort of sort them out the way I have here. And, and what I mean by with processing or no processing is just, is the farm responsible for arranging with a processor to sell in this channel? That's what, that's what that means. So we have um, the channels at the very top there in blue where we're selling meat by the cut, where we're, we, the farm, are going to have to arrange for processing. And that includes selling at farmer's markets, selling at our own farm store, selling to grocery stores and, re and restaurants by the cut. And then we have whole carcass channels where, again, we're going to have to arrange for the processing, like with the freezer trade, and maybe restaurants and butcher shops that are going to buy sides from us or, uh, you know, holes or something like that. And then finally, we have those tend to be brands, branded programs and commodity channels where we're, we're selling whole carcasses and we don't have to arrange for the processing at all. So the way I've lined these up is because we can start to think about the price that is possible to receive you know, the prices that are realistic in these channels. And we tend to think about uh, the prices being highest in those, those channels where we sell directly to the consumer by the cut. So the farmer's market, uh, I think most of us would expect to find the highest prices received by the farm in the farmer's market. And then on down the line with the lowest price received being in a commodity uh, channel or even I could have put an auction barn on there maybe. But... Um, what I want to get across, and, and I think I will with the, with the slides that follow, is that the price received does not automatically indicate the profit to the farm, right? Because each of these channels also has a degree of marketing labor required from the farm. And in fact, to receive those, those high prices and perform well in those direct-to-consumer or buy-the-cut channels, uh, the farm is going to have to put a lot of marketing effort in, right? 
reaching consumers, establishing a brand identity, spending time doing sales, delivering the product, or, or like I said, stand, standing at the farmer's market booth and, and, and putting that time in. So there's a different level of marketing required in, in these channels and I've ranked them and it tends to go hand in hand with the price that we receive. So when we have these higher prices, we also have to keep an eye on the fact that we have higher costs. And those costs may come in the value of our time, but of course that's important for us to measure when we're comparing and evaluating channels. So I'm not, as I've ranked these here, I'm not calling any channel good or bad. I'm just ranking them for the effort we have to put in and the kind of price that we would expect to receive. So the pricing challenge that, that I tried to address with, with my approach to pricing and with the pricing tool that, that I developed at Cooperative Extension is this, is that each channel, as we just saw, each channel comes with a different set of costs. Um, largely, we're going to be talking about the value of our time. That's the biggest cost and it's probably the most variable across channels, although there are other market channel costs for, for marketing. And then each cut that we have in a carcass, whether we've got uh, sheep, pork, or beef, each cut comes in a certain proportion or a yield. And each of those cuts has a certain level of customer demand in the channel. I, I would actually say that the level of demand for individual cuts varies from channel to channel. Let's say um, from farmer's market sales to restaurant sales, but also we could say from one farmer's market to another, right? If you're doing a, a farmer's market in a, in, a, in a big city area, you probably see different demand levels for certain cuts than you would if you're doing a farmer's market in a rural area. So we've got this, this sort of uh, confusion that comes from the different levels of cost in our different channels, the different proportion or yield of different cuts, and then the level of demand for those cuts in the various channels. Therefore, the solution is to create a unique set of prices for each channel that you use. Now, some people get nervous about coming up with different sets of price sheets, right? But what these price sheets are gonna reflect is that we have different costs. And um, I was giving this presentation to uh, farmers in, in Pennsylvania and um, a, a couple that, that markets beef and pork said, well, we do a farmer's market in Pittsburgh. Right, big city, and, and then that's two hours away, but we also do one in our hometown. And they said, well, wouldn't the Pittsburgh customers get upset if they found out that we were using different lower prices in our hometown farmer's market? And I said, no, not at all. You can tell them that they're welcome to make the two hour drive to save money on beef and pork, right? So you get the idea here, your costs are different and your customers aren't gonna mind because they don't want to take those costs. In this, in this case, it's obvious. It's that two hour drive or round trip, it's four hours. So you can see the merit in having different price sheets. Uh, mind you, if, you've, if you're doing two farmer's markets, they're both a half an hour from your home, then, uh, then I don't advocate for two separate price sheets. So you know, given these conditions that we talked about and needing a unique set of prices for each channel, that, that unique set of prices kind of leads people to think that they're going to have different levels of profit in the different channels that we sell in. And I think for ease of, of decision-making and evaluating channel performance, we should just come up with a scenario where the, we, we don't have different profit levels. Why, why would we expect different levels of profit when we market our animals in different market channels? That is usually the kind of way that we think, but we can create a scenario where the profit per head is a fixed value across all channels. And therefore, the only variable that's going to influence pricing is the cost of marketing. So let me give you the, this hypothetical example. Again, these numbers are made up just to illustrate a point. So here we're going to be raising this, this animal. Let's, let's say it's a beef animal. Um, our cost of production on an animal is the same whether we're going to sell it in the farmer's market or to restaurants or to customers for quarters and halves, right? So I fixed our cost of production across all channels. Now we're gonna take that animal to a processor. For the sake of argument, we're gonna use our, our same processor regardless of what channel we sell it in. So we can fix the cost of processing, um, you know, based on the carcass weight across all channels as well. Now we've identified our farm income goals and we fixed a profit per head that we need to make on these animals. So if we keep that fixed across all channels, then the only thing that's gonna be left for, to, for variable is our marketing cost. 
And here we're going to estimate the amount of time that's going to take us to sell all the meat from that one animal in these various channels and assign all that time a value. So you can see that in the farmer's market, where I think it's going to take us the most time, um, we, we're going to gross more on that animal, but our profit is going to be the same across all channels. In the restaurant sales, I think it's going to take us a lot less time. We're going to have our restaurants placing larger orders. It's going to take us less time to make those sales. So we can cut our, our market labor cost in half, uh, and therefore we can gross less, but we're still going to profit the same on that animal. And then finally, the freezer trade, maybe we're dealing with some repeat customers who buy from us year after year, even less marketing labor involved, and therefore we can gross less. So when we think about the approach to pricing, I really want to think about preserving the farm's income goals and therefore fixing desired profit across all channels. So the next uh, discussion about pricing is, is to think about how to break our businesses up. And uh, you know I don't do a lot of um, working with folks on cost of production, but it is uh, an important number to understand. So when I ask people, you know, when I work with people on, on cost of production, I try to get them to break their farm up into multiple businesses. And the same goes for this discussion. So think about your farm at least as being two operations, right? You have a production business and then a marketing and sales business. And the production business, it, it produces finished slaughter-ready animals. And then it sells those slaughter-ready animals to your marketing and sales business. The, the price at which you sell those animals to yourself, you should have a, a, an idea of what that value is. You know, you calculate your cost of production, look at market value, and then make that decision. You can actually take your farm and break it up into multiple businesses. For anyone who's got breeding herd, that, that's a business in itself, and it produces feeders. That's its product to sell. So when we think about, our, again, our, our decision making in terms of our, our farm business, there is a market for feeders, whether it's feeder pigs or feeder lambs or, or feeder beef. And we could sell those feeders out into the market. Likewise, we could buy feeders into our farm. Perhaps we can buy good quality feeders for less than it's going to cost us to produce them. That'd be a good thing to investigate and find out. Uh, then we can run a feeding and finishing operation. Same idea I just discussed. It produces finished slaughter ready animals. That's where production ends is when we decide that animal is going to, is going to take that trip. So our marketing and sales business and it you know, pays a processor to process our meat and then conducts the sales. So as we retain an animal across this chain from, from birth to freezer, what we're doing, of course, I didn't put it in the diagram, but we're adding value, constantly adding value to that animal. But with that added value comes uh, added costs, cost of, of feed and care, carrying it through, and, and therefore an increased risk that, that we might have a loss. So it, let me give you an example of if a, if a lamb is born and, and it dies within two days, that's a financial loss for the farm. We had to keep that ewe all year. Now we lost the lamb, right? So that's, that's on the far left of this diagram. But if we, if we retain that lamb and we feed it and we take it to the processor and we pay the processing and trucking bill, and then we have it in a freezer back at the farm and the freezer goes bad and all the meat spoils, we've got a greater loss, right? So as we retain these animals, we're adding cost and increasing risk, and, and yes, we're adding value. Right? My point in illustrating this is that there's, there's sort of opportunities along this chain to get out of the system or maybe to buy in cheaper supplies. So if we're gonna keep our own animals, we need to justify that with a greater reward, right? We're taking on this risk, we want a great reward. And that I'm gonna come back to that idea when we talk about uh, marketing profit. So, this is, the, this is the icon here for the, the meat pricing tool. You can use it to price meat by the carcass or by the cut. You will need to prepare with data from your farm, and I'll give a list at the end of these slides of the data that you need to gather. But I'm also going to walk through and do a demonstration of the pricing tool, uh, and you'll see you know, the kind of numbers that we're entering. I'm going to give you um, another illustration because I really like learning with images. So I'm going to give you another illustration of what we're going to be doing with the tool and then we'll finally jump into a demonstration of it. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna accumulate all of the costs um, and, and then our profit goals. So uh, what we're gonna gather numbers on as our cost of production for that animal, 
and then our desired production profit because we want our production business to be profitable, not break even. We're gonna have our trucking costs, driving the animal to the processor and then driving back to the processor, in essence, to bring the, the animal back home as packaged meat. We're gonna have our processing costs and then our cost of our marketing effort. And finally, our marketing profit. And that marketing profit is the, is the sort of big reward that I was alluding to that logically we should receive if we're gonna take these, these risks. So when we gather all of these costs and, and profit goals, we gather them together, we have one big number. And then we take that number and we redistribute it across the different pieces of meat that we have to sell. That's basically the logic behind how the pricing tool works. It, it just takes this and makes it a little simpler to understand. Gather up all those costs, including our profit goals. And now we just have to take these dollars and redistribute them across the cuts. The way that we're gonna choose to redistribute them is based on the yield that those cuts come from the carcass. So that I tried to show yield with the percentage signs here. We might have a lot of yield on certain cuts like the ground and then smaller yields on high value, it tends to be high value cuts like, the, like steaks and chops. And we have consumer demand for those cuts. So big shopping cart means lots of people wanna buy steaks and chops, right? Small shopping carts mean fewer people are interested in buying our roasts and our, our stew meat and so on. So this is all going through our head as we work on pricing. Uh, when, we, when I do open up the pricing tool and start to do that demonstration, I'm going to um, enter some of these numbers and I want to talk about them now so that we know what I'm talking about when we get there. The break even cost of production is what it takes for us to get that animal finished and slaughter ready. And then the production profit is what we want to receive for that side of our business. So we're talking about production profit and marketing profit for these two different and unique efforts. So I'm going to use a beef example tonight, and I'm going to say that the break-even cost of production on this beef animal is $1,300 per head. And then I'm going to allocate $100 as the profit per head that I want to receive on my production side. Next, I'm going to look at the, the cost of uh, marketing. So how much time will I invest in selling? You probably don't have this number available to you today, but as you go through selling animals in the coming months, you could maybe keep a log or start to keep track of how long it takes you to sell all that meat. Uh, for the farmer's market, I'm gonna estimate it's gonna take me 40 hours to sell all the meat from one animal. Of course, it doesn't work that, that neat and clean where you just start and finish and sell all that meat, but you can estimate based on total sales and, and what you've been moving. I'm gonna estimate it takes me less time than that to sell to restaurants because they place larger orders. Freezer trade customers, again, hopefully they're buying sides and quarters. It's gonna take me even less time and then um, other, other channels that uh, just load animals on trailers for. So we're gonna to try to estimate our time spent selling. That includes all the effort uh, of selling. And then I'm gonna place a value on that time. So I show you a breakout down in the lower left. I'm thinking if I sell 80 pounds of beef per farmer's market, then that's gonna take me five farmer's markets to sell all the meat from this one animal. Yeah, I, if each farmer's market is six hours long, and I've got an hour at a time to prep and drive over there, and then an hour at the end to pack up and drive home. That's an eight hour farmer's market for me. If I pay myself $15 an hour, I'm gonna say it costs me $600 a head to sell meat through the farmer's market. And now in addition to that cost, see getting paid that 600 bucks is not profit to the farm. That's the value of marketing effort. So the profit or the big reward for going through this trouble and going through these activities is to get this extra $500 ahead. Now, I, I made the $500 up. It's not the correct answer for everybody, but I wanted to use that number in my pricing example. All right, so this is the web address for the tool. And right before I um, get into the demo, I understand we're just gonna take a, a short break for questions. And then um, when we come back from the break, I'll actually uh, open up the website and start the demo. So we did have uh, questions come into the chat, um, and it's two very similar questions, so I think we can merge them. Um, usually the marketplace will give you feedback on your pricing, if too high, um, if you have undersold meat, price too low and whatnot. So um, how about pricing according to whatever the market can bear? Sure, and, and what that market can bear 
will come um, with experience, right? You'll get your customer feedback. Of course, there's you know this uh, conventional wisdom that you should always have a certain percentage of the population complaining about your price. It's kind of something that's been handed down to me, but um, yeah, what we're going to try to do is use uh, the ver or the variety of cuts to sort of uh, distribute those costs across across all those cuts and hopefully wind up with sort of a matrix that works for our customers. But yeah, of course there is, there is a price that the market will bear in, in each channel. And we'll discuss some of that right at the end of the calculator demonstration. And then one more question. Um, and I'm trying to figure out how to word this, um, but I think it comes to kind of like what profit you should expect um, and the other side of that equation is your cost for raising that animal. Um, so, you know, so is it optimistic to think that we can raise a steer to 1,400 pounds for a thousand dollars, or you know, how do we raise a steer more affordably? Market being aside. Well, so that's um, that's a, a question slightly confusing. It it sounds like maybe what they're asking is. You know, if we find that we, we feel our pricing is too high, you know, what can we address that by trying to cut our cost of production? Is it is that? Is I that, think that's where they're going. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, that that's very true. And and thanks for asking that because um, sure, you know, if if we set our farm's financial goals, let's say, you know, we might find that they're just unrealistic or, uh, as you say in that example, you know, we might come up with prices that are ultimately not realistic for the market. And, and so we have to look at, you know, what are the options in front of us? Do we need to find ways to cut costs? Uh, do we need to seek other markets? Um, or, you know, do we need to revise our profit goals and our expectations for, for sales? Yeah. Um, that, that's that's a, a good question. And I think that's ultimately how you have to think about it. And, and I did, you know, I encountered a farm that was you know, frankly marketing a very small number of animals and they did have their prices. Um, I think they had their prices set very well for, for where they were marketing. Um, and they found that they couldn't make enough money for the farm, just you know, selling a small number of animals at high prices. And, and that's a tough discussion to have. It's, it's, yeah, it's maybe you need to look at cutting some costs. Maybe you need to look at other forms of income from the farm because you know, you're not going to be able to make a living just selling these 20 head a year. So it, there's a lot of uh, discussion, a lot of questions to ask about the whole farm operation and, and its uh, ability to contribute. Well, those are good points. Thank you. All right. So we do have um, some more poll questions to ask during this um, little break. All right, so the first question we have is when selling meat by the cut, which cut um, do you sell out of first? Do you sell out of steaks, burgers, roasts, others, or I don't sell my meat by individual cuts? The second question we have for you is when selling meat by the cut, which cut is slowest to sell or ends up being stockpiled? Um, is it steaks, burgers, roasts, others, or that you don't sell your meat by individual cuts? And we'll give you guys a few seconds to go ahead and answer those questions. I'm, I'm really excited to see the results of this one. Of course, I just took a sip of water and got it down the wrong pipe. <clears throat> so it's interesting to see that burgers, you know, running really strong in um, cuts that sell quickly because there are those farms that say that uh, burger is is the cut that they find the most difficult to sell, and there are always those who sell out of it very quickly. And that's um, I'm sure that's got to do with dynamics around the channels that they're using, and uh, perhaps even their pricing. All right, it looks like we're kind of stalled out at that eighty percent. So I'm going to go ahead and end the poll, and we'll share the results. So the majority said that they don't um, sell meat by the individual cuts. Um, but as you guys can see there, um, that 
Um, people sell a lot of steaks and burgers, and then they tend to stockpile quite a bit of roasts. So with that, I'll pass it back over to you, Matt. Okay, so I'm gonna just have to switch to my web browser to do the demo. Uh, yeah, so when you arrive at the calculator, and, and I'll hand out the, the web address to this at the end, and I kind of sometimes ask, don't try to go and visit the site right now. Let me get through the demo, uh, and I'll and I'll share the the web address with you at the end. But um, when you arrive, it gives you some of the material that I've just discussed with you. And all, what we're going to do is we're going to progress through these dots when we use the tool. So the first question that we're going to answer is what for which market channel are you pricing? So I'm going to do an example where we're pricing for the farmers market. And then are you selling, uh, are you creating a price for individual cuts or for by hanging weight? And I'll say cuts. So again, I'll mention, uh, I wasn't going to do the demo type for hanging weight, but it is very, um, you know, comparably it's easy because you don't have to bring all the cuts home and weigh them out to use that pricing tool. Uh, it's fairly simple. And then what species are you pricing? So I'm going to check the beef box. And just so folks know, um, there's nothing different about the programming on the back end, whether it's a beef or a goat or a lamb. It's just just kind of like a survey question, if you will. And then you can go on to the next page. So what's nice about the tool is right up here, it's going to remind you what you're working on. You're pricing beef cuts for farmer's market. So now we're going to get into entering those costs that we've gathered. So the first question will be, what's your break even cost of production per head? And as I mentioned in my slides, I'm going to use $1,300. And then I can put in a production profit. Again, think about this going to the production part of our farm because we don't want that to be break even. I could do it as a percentage of this cost right here, or I can enter a flat goal per head. So that's what I'm going to do for my example is say $100. You can um, click on this link and visit USDA price reports on, on beef, pork, and, and lamb. If you want to, but I guess what I, the reason I put that link there is because if you don't have a cost of production calculated, my first piece of advice would be start working on one and reach out to, to your extension agent for help. Come up with a cost of production that's realistic for your farm. If you're, if you're really lacking that, uh, we do know that the average profit per head, let's say on, on beef in the US uh, through conventional markets is $100 per head. So you could look at current market prices and assume uh, if that profit per head is consistent and, and use current market price as your cost of production number. I, I really um, would rather see people come up with their own number and, and make it realistic. You know, this $1,300, I got that estimate from a, a friend who works in extension and raises beef. And it's to reflect, uh, you know, a, a small farm in New York state finishing beef breeds on grain. <clears throat> it's what he thinks is realistic. Certainly if you type just you know, $500 in here as your cost of production, you're gonna arrive at pricing at the end that seems very reasonable, but it actually is falling you know, really short of your goals. So this first number that you put in, is, it's a very important one. And um, you, you should work with extension folks uh, or with your own record keeping and, and develop a solid cost of production number. So we're gonna go on to the next page. And then we're gonna talk about trucking and delivery. The reason I included these costs is because they're easy to track. You know, I understand that record keeping is um, onerous for a lot of people, myself included. And so we're gonna keep track of the records that we that we can and the costs that, that seem reasonable to keep. So we're gonna enter our trucking costs for, for driving that animal to the processor. And then um, ultimately for driving back to the processor to pick up the meat and perhaps any added cost of delivering it to our customers. If you want help with that, you can use the trucking cost helper and you can just fill out some uh, numbers with these questions. How many head did you truck to the processor? I'm gonna say I took a load of four and what was your total cost for fuel and, and any other associated costs? I'll say it was $120. How many hours did you spend? I, I spent four hours driving round trip and what's a good hourly rate for your time? I think $15 an hour. So that's gonna tell me that my cost for trucking one animal was $45. And so I could use that number, but I'm going to stick to my script here and use $35. And then in this farmer's market example, I'm just going to drive back, pick up the meat and bring it home to, in my freezers for, for when I go to market. 
So I'm gonna say it's the same cost per head to drive back and pick the meat up. And I can just go on to the next page. And then we have our processing costs. Nice thing about these records or these costs is that they're reflected on your invoice from the processor. So they shouldn't be too hard to find. I'm gonna choose the hot carcass weight or the hanging weight. Uh, this is what you get billed uh, for things like cut and wrap against. So that would usually be on the invoice. And let me say that um, it's, it's written right here on the site. For this, you should choose one typical, you know, average animal from your herd and then keep these records, re record its carcass weight, and then bring all the meat from just that animal home and weigh it out. Everything that you sell from that animal. Uh, if you keep a lot of records and you have this for a group, you could take an average from that group and use that number in the calculator. But assuming that most people don't do uh, all this weighing out of cuts, my advice is choose one animal. Don't choose the best one you've ever seen on the farm. Choose one that's that's very typical and average and decide just to keep records with this one animal, record the carcass weight, and then record all the cuts received. So next we're gonna enter the kill or the slaughter cost that we pay at the processor. And for my example, I'm gonna say that's $85 a head. And then the cut and wrap is 85 cents a pound in my example. So of course, don't forget that decimal because um, most places are still under a dollar. Uh, make sure you have that decimal point in your, in your cost. If you do have extra processing done, like having patties made, having sausages or any smoking done, you can record that here. You're gonna wanna put the name of the product. So I'm gonna say uh, hot dogs and then what the processor charged you in additional additional processing charges. So if they charge you 35 cents a pound to make hot dogs, you would put that extra charge. Uh, later on, a few tabs, we're gonna be able to record how many pounds were made in the hot dogs. Uh, but for tonight's example, to keep it simple, I'm just gonna say, no, I don't have any additional processing costs. And I'm gonna go on to the next page. So now we get to weights and yield. This is where we're gonna enter uh, every cut in every piece that we have to sell from that animal. And then the number of pounds that we receive. Uh, fortunately, I've used this tool enough that it remembers my answers from last time, but when you're using it, you'll have to type them out. Uh, I didn't wanna make you all sit and watch me type because I'm not that fast typer. Um, so I'm gonna put in the names of all the cuts. You don't have to use a particular uh, conventional Naming, you can, you can name it, you know, whatever you want to name it, the regional names or whatever you have for different cuts of meat. And uh, if you have something like uh, lamb and you're selling the pelt, <clears throat> excuse me, you're selling the pelt, you can even put that down in here because that contributes to the total sales volume from the animal. And when you cut to the pounds, just say one because you, will, you just have one pelt to sell. All right, so now I'm going to enter how many pounds I received off the animal. So I'm gonna to have to just type little pounds in here for each cut. Bear with me a minute while I do that. Your, your browser, if you do everything uh, in the same order like I'm doing every time you use it, your browser will tend to remember the names of the cuts and save you. you wanna do different tracing uh, schemes Keep, keep a set of notes the way I do, and then just come come to the site with your script in hand. All your all your inf information is already gathered, and that way you just have to type it in instead of scrambling around to find it. Okay, now I've got all of my cuts entered and the number of pounds that I received from this from this one animal or the average from my group. And so I can go on to the next page. But I just mentioned quickly, you, you can add all the cuts that you need to. So you could make that list uh, long or short as, need, as you need to. Okay, so now what we're gonna get is a, a summary of what we've entered so far. Uh, from our 605 pound carcass, we have 389 pounds to sell. So our yield from carcass to retail is 64%. That's, that's a fine uh, yield on a beef animal. Uh, our carcass value is our cost of production plus our production profit, if you recall. We have our total on trucking, the slaughter cost, and then the cost of cut and wrap. And have we done additional processed uh, goods, the additional processing costs would be lumped into this cut and wrap. So, so far, our total cost, if you think about everything we've included so far, 
our cost for raising the animal, bringing it to the processor and bringing the packages of meat back to the farm into our freezer are, is $2,070. We haven't done any selling time yet. We've just done production, uh, trucking and processing. So now we're gonna get into the cost of marketing. So we can um, allocate our labor cost as a percent of this total cost up here or in a flat per head number. And for my example, selling at the farmer's market, I'm gonna say that 40 hours of time selling at the farmer's market at $15 an hour gives me a marketing cost of $600 per head. And then my desired profit, as I mentioned, that sort of, why are we doing this? Why are we going direct to consumer? Why are we taking on these risks and, and this extra work of marketing? It's because we want a greater profit per head or a greater sort of reward for that effort. And now I'm gonna make that $500 per head. So now I've basically just added $1,100 to the total cost so far. So now we get onto the next page and it's asking, uh, what is your current pricing? So if this is a market channel that you currently sell in, then uh, we'd, we, you, we'd have you put in your current prices. And in essence, the calculator will test to see if they reach your goals and cover your costs. If you're setting, uh, creating a set of prices for the very first time, then you can just enter $1 a pound for all these cuts. And on the next page, of course, it will tell you that those prices are too low, but that's okay. Um, it makes it a simple process just to say $1 a pound for all cuts. So my current pricing that I'm using at this farmer's market, these are hypothetical now. I'm gonna enter, enter them. You can see that it's showing how many pounds of each cut we have, parentheses next to the cut name. Again, gather all, before you visit the site and try to click through, gather your data from your farm, get all these materials and numbers put together on one sheet of paper or in one spot. That way when you sit down, you've, you've got it all with you and you can just buzz through. So now I've entered all of my current prices and I can go to the next page. Okay, and we get another summary. Your current weighted average price, that's, um, everybody's familiar with what a weighted average is. Uh, it's 675 a pound across all cuts. The total income from all cuts with our current set of prices would be $2,630. That's our total gross sales with our current price scenario. Uh, but based on our costs, our yields, the current pricing is short of our goal, again, our stated profit goal, by $538 per head. If you remember, I set a $500 marketing profit goal. So really this set of prices, it's not that um, they're totally terrible. They're paying for our time spent at the farmer's market, but they're just not delivering any profit for that effort. So $538 per head short with our current pricing. So on the next page, we can have a chance to revise prices. And the way that works, and really I kind of think of all these tabs that we've done before this are like the homework, this is the video game. This is the fun page. When you get here, you've got this red light. When you get your pricing to reach the stated goal, you're going to get a green light. So the game, in essence, is to start adjusting prices until, until you get a green light. And then you know that this pricing structure reaches the farm's goals. So I'm going to start making some price changes. And I'm going to zoom down here and I'm going to look at my ribeye price and think, wow, ribeye steaks, you know, they sell out quickly. Everybody loves a ribeye, so I'm going to make those more expensive. They're $19 a pound at the grocery stores local to where I live, so certainly I should be selling them for that at the farmer's market. And then my filet, sure, I'm going to raise my filet price way up by $10 a pound to $25 a pound. But look, we are chipping away at, at how short of our goal we are. It's reduced to $3.58 now. But look, when we raise filet prices by $10 a pound, we only have six and a half pounds to sell. It's not gonna have a big impact on the bottom line, if you will, with these price changes. That's why the poundage is displayed here because changing prices on cuts that we have more pounds of is gonna have a bigger impact. So I'll continue to change prices. Uh, short ribs, you know, they're really popular still. They were kind of the hot cut for a little while there and then raised them to 650. And uh, brisket is always in demand when people wanna smoke it or I'll barbecue it. So I'm going to raise that to $8 a pound. And my sirloin steaks could certainly stand to be a little higher. I'll go to 11. And finally, 
ground beef we have at five bucks a pound in our old pricing. And if we raise that, since there's 188 pounds, we raise that to 650, we get the green light. So now we're exceeding our goal by $7 a head. That's not really a big deal. We don't need to weasel that down to zero. Um, we can say, okay, now this re revised set of prices, this works for the farm, but this isn't where you stop adjusting prices. What you do when you get a green light is you start to think about what are the cuts that um, I'm always stockpiling and I'm always keeping in my freezer, right? Maybe it's the chuck roast down here. Maybe it's the rump roast. All right, maybe, maybe these are very slow moving cuts for me uh, in this channel particularly. And then what are the cuts that I tend to sell out of? Maybe I'm always selling out of grilling cuts, you know, steaks. So is there room to increase ribeye, sirloin steak price, um, strip steak price, filet, right? If I can raise some of these prices, in essence, what I want to do is use price to slow down consumer demand and make my pricing work as an inventory management tool so that hopefully I can use price to adjust the speed at which cuts sell to more closely match their yield on the carcass, right? So I have some room here to take low yield, high demand cuts and make them more expensive in essence so that fewer customers will buy them or that they'll buy them at a lower speed or lower rate and then take my slow moving cuts and maybe discount them while still keeping a green light so that they begin to sell faster. And I know that people feel nervous, you know, people um, selling to, to, you know, to their beloved customers start to get nervous about raising prices. But think of this, if you raise your price on the ribeye steak and your customer, you know, they, they come out to the, to the farmer's market or they come out to the farm with this idea that they're going to pick up some ribeyes and they arrive and they find that your, your, your prices are higher than they expected or than they remember. Uh, that doesn't mean that you've lost that customer. That means that you have an opportunity to direct them sort of down carcass and say, well, look, you know, uh, we have these sirloin steaks. They're, they're less. You're going to try to use those customers to help you with your inventory management. So sell them on some other cuts that you have to offer. The other thing I'll say uh, on this on this spot is, you know, if there are cuts that just never ever sell, stop bringing them back from the processor. It's time to find a different way to have those uh, parts cut and maybe even to turn them in the ground as we saw a lot of people can sell out of ground very quickly. So yeah, use this page. This is kind of the, the magic page on the pricing tool to think about consumer demand, think about yields, uh, which you can see there in, in the poundage display and start working with prices so that you can get your customers to move down into other cuts and help you move your inventory. And I think that's sort of the, the cleverness of, of using this tool. So now we've re revised our prices and we have a green light. We're gonna to go to the next page where we get uh, our new summary. And it's gonna tell us that we've increased our weighted average price across all cuts from 675 up to 816 that when we sell all the meat from this animal at the current pricing, we're gonna gross $3,176. And that while we used to be falling short of our goal, now we're exceeding our goal. So that's, that's good news. You can continue to click through the tool, um, take a short survey, uh, give us some information here. And if you do enter your email address, then um, you have the opportunity to have it email you with, with the values and with the final prices. And you can even uh, get a price list as a PDF file uh, that you can save and it will tell you uh, the date that you last worked on it, what channel you were setting prices for and what your new price list is. So you could print that out and, and save it. Or you know, if you have an honor system freezer in the barn, you can pin this price list up in the barn. So that is uh, how the tool works. And I just have a few more slides in conclusion. Then we'll take some questions. So there's the web address, calculator.meetsuite.com. I also have it at the end of my presentation. What's the point in working on pricing uh, in this fashion? It's to test and adjust the market channels that you use. Make sure that they're delivering the profit goals that the farm has. It's a way to account for your labor and your costs. And to, as we discussed, manage the inventory of cuts so that we don't have this problem of selling out of some cuts very quickly stockpiling others. 
it's a way to evaluate um, and, and set prices for new opportunities. Let's say a restaurant approaches you and says, hey, we'd love to get some uh, local beef on the menu at our restaurant. What do, your, what do your prices have to look like? You can do some estimation, talk with the, uh, with the restaurant and run through the tool to set a set of prices for a restaurant. It's also a way to help your wholesale buyers. If, if that restaurant wanted to buy sides from you, you could actually equip them with your uh, weights of your different cuts that you'd get out of a side and have them gawk through the tool, right? Their cost of production is what they pay you for that animal. And they could actually see how to sort of collect all their costs that they're gonna have when they buy a side and then how they can redistribute them across the, the, the different pieces. Of different cuts. Ultimately, it's to develop channel specific pricing that, that works for you. And what does it mean if you develop your prices and you get to the end of this price tool and you got your green light and you look at those prices and you say, my customers would never pay those prices. Uh, I had a, a good friend who works in extension, you know, watch me do this presentation. And then he said, you know, that that's great, Matt, but uh, I could never get those kinds of prices. Now he sells freezer beef. And I said to him, yeah, I agree. You could never get those prices because your total marketing effort is a, is a sticker with the farm name on the door of your pickup truck. That's your entire marketing program. So I don't think that you could get these prices. And what I'm saying here is that um, you may have chosen the wrong channel. You may be in the wrong farmer's market or approaching the wrong restaurant if they won't look at your prices or they don't like them. Uh, but also you may need to increase your marketing effort. And we showed that right in some of those first couple of slides. It takes um, marketing effort in order to receive the, the prices that we need in these various channels. So think about that, you know, think about uh, restaurants. If a restaurant doesn't recognize the value of your product, you're, you're not trying to sell to the correct restaurant, right? There are restaurants out there that will pay for farm to table that recognize the value. So it's just a question of, am I marketing in the right places and am I using the right amount of effort? To further address that, I'm gonna talk about something that I think we're all familiar with. Uh, I did a, a six year research project at, at Cornell where we captured um, 13 different traits for every lot of feeder calves that were sold at auction, like I said, for six years. And when we did a statistical analysis on that project, we found uh, what traits were contributing ultimately to the final price of any given lot of calves. So I think we all know what we, what we observed there. We found that the, the lots that received higher prices for feeder calves uh, had good bull genetics where the auctioneer would announce what the genetics were. They had a good body condition score. Those calves looked good in the ring. That bulls had been castrated, like actually weaned, not weaned on the truck ride to the auction, but, but actually weaned in advance and started on feed. And that the calves had been vaccinated and boosted. Again, not vaccinated the night before, but, but actually vaccinated and boosted. So when buyers saw these traits, they paid more for those calves. We could collect this, these traits and say that they represent applied production management, right? Good managers get all this kind of stuff done and receive the highest prices at the sale barn. So now let's think about what's the difference between $4 a pound ground beef uh, at the farmer's market and $8 a pound ground beef. Well, it comes down to a list of similar factors. Understanding your target market, who are the people that value my product, having a marketing strategy and conducting some research that is to understand our customers, to find the people who are pulling our product into the marketplace, who are demanding our product. To set a marketing budget, to be willing to spend time and money on our marketing effort to reach our customers in this channel, to have effective con consumer communication, and to spend time on marketing. Collectively, we could call these things applied marketing management. Really we need to support our pricing with our marketing effort. It, it is doable. Um, it can be done with, within reason. Um, Consumers that buy local meat do not buy it based on price alone. Uh, you do need to understand your customer and your customer's needs, their motivations that drive their purchasing, their desires, sort of the, the extras that they're looking for in a product and their buying habits. And by understanding these things, you can focus your marketing decisions and your activities to, to cater to that customer and, and communicate with them effectively. So this is called you know, uh, marketing effort, marketing strategy that's applied 
to support the pricing structure that we need to receive in these channels. Uh, when it comes to record keeping, when it comes to uh, thinking about your cost of production and, and your set of prices, you know, it can be overwhelming, but think about starting somewhere and then improving your record keeping system and your methods each year. Uh, what, what old uh, ag economists like to say is that you can't improve what you don't measure. And I think of it uh, in a positive light and say, you can improve what you do measure. So start, start recording some of these things, keep records, and you can always improve from there. Uh, snapshot record keeping, such as my example with pricing, where instead of trying to keep all of the records on all of the animals I get processed, right? I'm gonna choose one typical average animal, keep records on that one, and then trust that it represents the herd. And I don't have to do uh, record keeping on, on everybody if, if I don't think I'm gonna follow through with that. To successfully use the pricing tool, you need to prepare yourself in advance. Um, set, set aside some time to sit down where you won't be interrupted and, and click through all those pages and enter your data. Calculate a cost of production that's realistic and really represents the cost on your farm. Decide on your production profit per head. And then uh, estimate the amount of time you'll spend marketing. Um, decide on your marketing profit per head, sort of what's, what's the reason I'm going through these channels and going through this extra effort, what's, what's the reward? Come up with one head of data, which includes carcass weight, and then the weight of all the cuts received back. Have your processor invoice so you know what you paid for, for slaughter and, and cut and wrap and things like that, extra processing costs. Keep track of your trucking when you bring a load of animals to the processor. Uh, and then have a list of your current prices. Like I referred to before, I, I keep all my data on one sheet so that when I sit down to use the tool, I have everything already collected in front of me. It makes, makes my experience a little more pleasant. Um, if you search for Cornell Smart Marketing online, you'll find a series of marketing articles. Um, back in the end of 2017 and the beginning of 18, I wrote a series of four short articles or about two pages each that cover understanding the consumer, uh, marketing strategy and pricing. So you, you know, if you want to read more on this subject or more on meat marketing in general, you can search Cornell Smart Marketing and uh, find these uh, two-page articles uh, and download them. Finally, I'll just share my contact information. My my email address is there. Uh, if, if questions occur to you after the Q and A session's over, uh, you you can feel free to email me with questions about pricing. And uh, once again, there's the web address to use the pricing tool. So with, with that, um, I'm done and, and we can field some additional questions. So before we do the questions, we're gonna do our final poll, um, our final poll questions. So if you give me one second, I will get the, them up. So the questions that we're asking are, based on what you learned, how likely are you to adjust your current pricing? Very likely, likely, not likely, or definitely not likely. The second question is, based on what you learned, do you feel confident in your ability to set prices for a new market? Are you very confident, somewhat confident, minimally confident, or not confident at all? Well, it's great to see the way these are kind of shaking out. Um, at least, I, you know, when people think about pricing for a new opportunity, they, they feel pretty confident about how to approach that. And, um, you know, the same goes for cost of production. I, I think if you you see how you can break it up into small pieces, it makes the, you know, the accounting, if you will, less daunting. And then and that's what we try to do with the pricing. All right, we'll give it just a few more seconds and then um, I will turn it over to Ryan to moderate some questions. Ryan, you can go ahead and take it away. All right, thanks, Amanda. So uh, first question, um, we did have a few come in and through the chat. Um, and I think this refers to a situation which is pretty common. Um, you might be running a beef cow calf herd. Um, and so how do you factor in that cost production per head to include the feed uh, slash care costs for the cow during gestation? We're not buying feed or calves. Um, we're ret retaining ownership of that animal throughout its life. Sure. Yep. Yeah. So that's a cost of production question. And it's, it's just what I was just saying, break it up into pieces. So uh, if you are growing, your, you know, producing your own hay and your own feed, those are enterprises, right? You have a hay making enterprise. So look at your cost of production per bale of hay 
and and then think about in essence selling bales of hay to your cow calf operation because those cows are going to eat your hay. I mean, I'm just make, breaking this up to make it simple. Right? So when you start to think about, wow, how do I account for a finished steer when I've got cow calf and I've got feed and I, you know, break things up into small enterprises and just crunch those numbers. So haymaking operation, what cost can we allocate to the haymaking operation? We've got equipment, we've got fuel, we've got time, um, we've got you know, something about uh, our, our land or our inputs on the land. So now if we allocate all those costs and we look at the number of bales we made, we can come out with a break-even cost of production for, for hay bales. Okay, now we don't wanna be break-even. So we could think about, in essence, selling those hay bales out into the market. If we're gonna retain them and feed them to our cows and, and to our steers, then we're gonna sort of sell those hays to our other enterprises. Next, we've got a cow-calf enterprise where we have the cost of keeping the cows all year long and our, our saleable goods are our feeders. So we're gonna sell feeders to our feeding and finishing operation. So just think about the cost that we can allocate to the cow-calf or fractions of costs, right? If you're using uh, the same tractor for haying and for feeding the cows and for feeding the steers, then you can divide that cost up. But that's how I would approach coming at cost of production is breaking it up into enterprises, isolating them, allocating their costs, and, and you know basically looking at their output and dividing across the number of units produced, and then in essence, selling those items through the chain, just like I did with the, uh, that little diagram with the blue arrows where we're selling feeders to a feeding and finishing operation, we're selling finished animals to a marketing operation. That's my best advice, start somewhere like that, and then uh, improve your system year after year. No, oh, good advice, thank you. Next question, um, is there a similar tool uh, that would do the same thing for pricing poultry? Ah, that's a great question. Um, the answer is yes and no. There's nothing about this pricing tool that would prevent you from just tricking it. Uh, so if you're selling poultry by the piece, you can check any box you want, lamb, goat, pig, doesn't matter, uh, and just enter the names of your chicken cuts instead of your pork cuts. Just use all the numbers the same way that you would uh, if you were entering another species. Uh, we didn't put poultry in the tool when we made it, but there's nothing um, specific to those species in, in any of the math that would prevent you from just running poultry through in the same way. Perfect. Next question. Does by the cut method calculate the average price per pound or for the entire carcass? It calculates the weighted average for you, the weighted average price. So that's if you took all the pounds of the various cuts and sold them all at the various sets of prices that you have and got the total uh, and divided up by the total pounds, that's the weighted average price. So the pricing tool will show you your weighted average price for your current pricing scenario and then your revised pricing scenario. Is that, is that what the question was, you think? I, I believe so, yes. Um, if not, um, chat me back um, and we can circle back to that. Um, next question, how much time do you realistically think I should spend on my marketing plan? Um, yeah, okay, how, how much time? So, you know, my, my tough love answer is, you know, it depends on how, how much you need the farm to contribute to your income or, or you know, how, you know how, how important it is. So if you're going to have, let's say, a direct-to-consumer presence, you're going to need a marketing plan that reflects uh, establishing brand identity. That's, that's generic work, right? Not, not channel specific, but just letting people know that we're here, letting, letting them know what we produce. And then some additional time selling in each channel that you use. So there's no um, simple answer for that, but, but I find that a plan makes it easier to do the work of marketing than, than when you don't have one. So um, I, I would advise people to create even a simple um, marketing plan that that guides their decision making and 
kind of dictates how much time they should be spending on marketing. But there's there's so many factors there, like how many head are you marketing and how much channels are you using? And so there, there's no quick and simple answer, but but in essence, if, if you need your business to perform uh, seriously, then then you need to spend some time on a marketing plan. All right, thank you. Next question, how can you apply your farm schedule to estimating your cost of production? And I'm not sure if they're referring to farm schedule for taxes or not, we might have to clarify that. Hmm, okay. Yeah, I don't know that the Schedule F, uh, I, I don't do taxes, so I'm not super familiar with the Schedule F, but if it's got to do with your sort of weekly schedule, um, again, I'd come back to the idea of snapshot record keeping. You don't have to keep constant logs of all your activities on the farm in order to allocate those costs of time to your, to your enterprises. But what if you took a sample week and kept a notebook in your pocket and wrote down, you know, what activity was I doing and you know, which, which enterprise do I allocate that cost to? So I was out, um, you know, feeding, feeding cattle. That's something that happens every day, right? So you could begin to build some estimates per week or per month and uh, assign them out. And the way that I would do that, very practically speaking, is to keep a little notebook in my pocket or, or if you're more oriented towards phones, uh, keep a phone, open up a, a notes page and, and make some notes. That's the whole idea of you know, snapshot record keeping, pick a small period of time, keep records there, develop your system for record keeping, and then you can always work to improve it through time. Oh, that sounds good. I think that's um, a real practical way uh, of approaching it. So uh, back to more, so a few more marketing questions coming in. What, best way to invoice customers for holes and halves, do I break out the processing cost? That question has a couple layers. Uh, so for custom exempt processing, to the letter of the law, the customer should be paying the processor separately. Um, however, I think it's a form of customer service to just keep it simple for your customer. And frankly, uh, I mean, I guess I can't give that kind of advice, but I would, I would invoice my customer with one price that includes the cost of processing because uh, I want my communication with them to be very simple, not getting into, well, there's this and there's that. That's what I usually recommend to folks. And then if you're uh, really, um, you know, you want to go by the letter of the law, you could have them still write two checks to you, but just present one invoice. Or at least when they're making the commitment to buy or they're inquiring to buy, just give them one price. That's a price per pound hanging weight that includes the cost of processing. Sounds good. And I think a follow-up to that is um, marking again, sell by live weight or carcass weight? If I was selling quarters, halves, and holes, I would definitely go by carcass weight. I think it's, um, you know, there's there's a reason the industry uses it and carcass weight is, is um, you know, for most people, an easier weight to get than the live weight. So I really would advise to use hanging weight. All right, thanks. And then, uh, Bill, you might have to help me out here. I think you were trying to help respond to one of the earlier questions, um, trying to differentiate between pricing on retail product um, or versus carcass weight basis. Yeah, I think <clears throat> yeah, um, your tool calculates it out on a average per pound for retail products sold, not necessarily on a carcass weight basis. Yeah, so there's, at the, on the very first page, you can elect to work on pricing for carcasses. And I didn't do that example because it's simple. Um, you know, it's, it's not too hard. I think people can navigate it, but you can choose uh, right on the first page of the pricing tool, um, which channel you're pricing for, and then say that you're pricing by the carcass and choose your species and carry on from there. Uh, it's like I said, it's a shorter process because you don't have to enter all the names of all the cuts and all the weights. So uh, carcass pricing is a little easier. Right. Pricing. Your example, when it showed an average, it was the average price per pound of retail products. 
That's correct. Yeah. The way that it averaged across all. The yeah. It didn't back it all the way out to the carcass base, but you could do that if you knew what your carcass average weight was and your retail product was yourself. Pretty easy. Oh, thanks for clarifying that. And then just looking through the chat here, I know Gene's dropped in a couple helpful, useful links here, um, especially in regards to um, a farm uh, program that uh, incorporates Schedule F um, in our wrap up here. Um, we're going to show the Livestock Topic Hub again um, that has some enterprise budgets and might get more into specific situations and determining costs, whether it's for cow, calf or uh, feedlot, what have you, that definitely could be customized for these situations. Um, and other university extensions have them too, if you do a little searching. Um, but with that, um, I, if there's not last call for questions, uh, if not, we will turn it back over to Carolyn to uh, take us home for the night. One last question here before we uh, pull up the closing here. Um, since you have to sell the animal prior to processing, how do you communicate to the customer uh, the price for the meat? I would use your pricing that you present to the customer as dollars per pound hanging weight, including the cost of processing. I would, you know, I'd work on that at home or on the pricing tool in advance and then you know, from experience, when you kind of learn the range uh, of, um, you know, of carcass weights that you see off your farm, you can begin to estimate. So I, I used to have a, a slide in this presentation. It, it's a customer saying, so how much does a quarter of a beef cost, right? And the farmer says, well, there's the, the carcass weight, and then I pay the processor, and they kind of wander around, right? And at the end, the customer has no idea what they just said. So if, if I would base my pricing on dollars per pound, hanging weight, including the cost of processing. But what I would answer when the customer says, hey, how much is a quarter of a beef? I'd say, well, it ranges between $650 and $700, and you're gonna receive you know, about 90 to 100 pounds. Right? I'm gonna tell them what they should expect to expect, uh, expend and what they should expect to receive. And my pricing, because I don't know that carcass weight yet, is still based on the carcass weight. I hope. I hope that was as clear as an unmuddy lake. No, that's okay. And then maybe just uh, maybe a little follow up on that. If it, one of the things we've experienced a few years ago, there was some survey work with local processors in Wisconsin how they priced. Um, you know, how do you communicate kind of the unknown that there are the special requests? If you want everything vacuum packed or some of those extras, you are going to end up paying extra. Sure, I guess if you're going to be paying additional processing fees, it, it comes up a lot with pork. You know, I, I would have a base price and then say there will be additional charges for smoking or for, you know, if you want patties made. Those are electives for the customer. Um, we don't see those value-added products come up quite as often with beef processing. So it's, it's um, but yeah, I wouldn't be afraid to, to divulge them as added costs because because people can choose them but the nice thing about basing your price on the carcass weight is that person can choose to have everything closely trimmed and boneless and the farm doesn't have to pay for those losses right the customer is receiving what they ordered and they, they paid based on the carcass weight that's that's really the rationale for carcass weight pricing so that that customer can make those choices and receive a, a lower yield based on their preferences and um, it's not going to it's not going to hurt the farm. And then related to that, I don't know if you have experience with this or not, or someone else does. Um, does Cryovac sell higher than white paper wrap with direct cuts to consumer? I would say, yeah, absolutely. If you're selling meat by the cut retail, whether it's at a farmer's market or in a, uh, a freezer case in your barn, people like to see the color um, of the meat. They like to see the product. So Cryovac is best for retail. If you're selling um, freezer beef, quarters, halves, and holes, uh, there's nothing wrong with getting paper. Uh, it's it's fine. It lasts a really long time. I've never had a problem with paper wrap. Yeah, and someone's asking about the custom exempt meat processing. So I might need uh, Gene to hop in because I don't know all of Wisconsin's rules, but in most states, you need to, uh, if you're going to have an animal processed at a custom exempt plant where it's not USDA inspected, you need to have that animal sold before the processing date. 
You can document that by having the customer give you a deposit or even send you an email agreeing to buy it. But in essence, when you sell through, uh, through quarters and halves, you're not selling customers meat. You're selling them an animal. And in this case, you've got four owners on the animal. So no one actually sells that meat. The meat will often come back in packages that are marked not for sale. That's because the owner of that animal can't sell that meat. They're, re they're receiving it for their own consumption. So it's a nice, um, you know, around my region, we have a limited number of USDA inspected plants. That's necessary uh, for any retail cut situation, right? But then we have um, an, another line of plants that are custom exempt and anyone who's selling quarters and a whole structured consumer can take advantage of using those plants even if the USDA places are booked up. Uh, they can use them legally by selling the animal while it's still alive. And then um, you, can, you can bill your customer after the, the processing, uh, but, but they technically own the animal when it goes to slaughter. So that's what custom exempt really means. Oh, good. Thank you. And um, that's always a good thing to brush up on before you get too deep into this. And um, I don't know my colleagues, I always struggle with this because we do have a mix in Wisconsin um, between state and federally inspected. And I think there's some regional differences. Um, my colleagues can expand more on that. But if you're close to a state line like I am, you do get more interest in that because there's obviously the lure of, well, then I can sell across state lines as well. So yeah, there's a comment in the chat. In Wisconsin, Department of Ag rules apply. Need to understand the regs that apply to your situation. That's um, always good to double check. So thank you for joining us tonight, whether you were um, joining us live or you watch us at a later date in time. This is our last installment of our special beef edition for Wisconsin. Um, thank you for joining us and please um, fill out our evaluation surveys that Sandy will be sending out later this week or the next week that will help us um, determine what kind of educational opportunities you guys would like in the future. And please visit us at livestock.extension.wis.edu. Here are, is our contact information. If you would like to contact any one of us tonight on tonight's presentation or feel free to contact your local extension agent. And this evening's um, session was recorded and will be shared with you via email at a later date. Here is our topic website. And um, we've been discussing different types of tools to help you manage your operations. And you can find those here at the decision tools and software section. And thank you and have a great night.